and for families that are committed to raising up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It is a precious gift as the, as the word uh, was shared there during our time of praise and worship. The body of Christ is, is, a, is a precious and wonderful gift from God. The, the Lord is, has made us, you know, I, I state the, the obvious, he's made us natural. And, uh, and yet we understand that in this spiritual relationship with God, we, we are united with an unseen being, a God who is our father, but God knows the, the needs that we have and uh, how wonderfully he has provided for uh, his people through his people. Amen? Amen. He's present in our hearts and lives. He's, his, his word to us is that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And you can be, uh, you may have been forsaken by all men and you're never alone because the Lord Jesus is with you. Amen? Amen. But how rich the blessings that the Lord does provide for us as our hearts and lives are knit together with one another in the body of Christ. We bear one another's burdens. We laugh with one another. We, we rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those that weep. Amen? And he said that it's, it's a wonderful thing that brethren would dwell together in unity. Amen? By this shall, it's no small part of our witness. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another. Amen? Amen. And the, <clears throat> the gift of the body of Christ should be highly esteemed. And we should be ever deeply thankful to the Father for brothers and sisters of like precious faith. Hallelujah. Remember to pray for the Zeru's. Uh, they're uh, well into the week now. Uh, they'd, have, have, uh, they'd have had uh, several meetings there and more out in front. So continue to pray for Pastor Ron. Pastor uh, <clears throat> Ron will be speaking at the conferences there in Kasumu. Anybody taking the time to look up Kasumu on the map? No? Uh, pull it on out. Pull out the map of Africa. Find Lake Victoria. That's an easy landmark. And somewhere on the eastern, southeastern side of, uh, of, of Lake Victoria, you'll find a uh, a uh, city called Kasumu, and that's where Ron and Walid with their wives are right now. And they're praying and trusting Father for a good and fruitful time of ministry, not only in the, in the meetings, but also through the extended and ongoing work of, of the distribution of the books. So pray. Amen? Amen? Anybody got one of the verses to share with us this evening? Bill? And the other one from uh, Galatians 5? May do you have Galatians 5? 6 9? Okay, go right ahead. Amen. We were talking about sowing and reaping. Amen? And we are to sow to the Spirit that we might of the Spirit re reap life everlasting. Amen? Amen. Francis? Amen. Amen. If we live in the Spirit, if you're alive as a Christian, you're born again. You live now in the Spirit. You're no longer dead spiritually. You're alive. So walk in the Spirit. Walk led and directed by God's Spirit. Amen? Walk with the, the, the spiritual uh, dimensions or aspects of our existence in clear focus. Our minds set on the things that are above. Amen? Not on things on this earth. We talked there on Sunday some of, of the different ways of looking at sowing. Amen? Setting our minds on or laboring. <clears throat> Serving, seeking. Amen? Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the book of Isaiah, chapter 8. I often encourage uh, all to take the time to prepare well for the home fellowship group meetings. <clears throat> the ground that we talk of, uh, talk on uh, this evening is along the lines of some of the material that we'll be discussing in our Friday meeting on preaching. But it's really on my heart to emphasize the, the power of the Word of God, the importance uh, there is in us preaching, staying close to the Word in, in, uh, in, in our ministry. And I use that, uh, I use that <clears throat> uh, carefully because that, that term uh, ministry, because 
we're really only bringing care if we bring care from the heart of God. Amen? And one of the most effective means of bringing care from the heart of God is, is bringing truth to people. Truth sets people free. It opens up blind eyes, doesn't it? Uh, furthermore, it exposes the, the lie, the darkness, doesn't it? Truth has that power, very powerful. And we as the people of God, uh, knowing these things, uh, should be careful to stay close to the truth of God's word. I've, uh, just on my heart, uh, I wouldn't say uh, a heaviness, but uh, I just had opportunities in, in uh, recent days to... Uh, to uh, recognize that even uh, it's, it's far too common among uh, professing Christians for there to be a departure from the truths of Scripture. Any Bible-believing Christian understands that the Bible is to be believed. <laughs> Anybody is going to profess Christianity, and I... Uh, uh, I did not look up the statistic, but um, Pastor John Miller, will, he, he likes to bring in statistics from different polls, you know, uh, Barna or Gallup or uh, different ones that will uh, do polls. And uh, he brought in one the other day, and if I'm not mistaken, he said that some 70% of Christians, professing Christians, born-again Christians, don't necessarily believe that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible word of God. How can that be? How can that be? Now, we wouldn't consider those, it's likely that, that those people are born again, would we? No. Because a born again Christian understands that they were born again by the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. Amen? And they believe that the, the word in its full counsel is the inspired and infallible word of God. It is an authoritative rule for us, isn't it? It is the means by which we live, and if necessary, it, it, it's by these words that we will die. That is to say, we're prepared to die for our, our allegiance to God and to these truths, aren't we? Yeah. We make decisions, sometimes hard decisions, uh, decisions that bring about division among uh, close friends or family, <clears throat> decisions that cost us. Decisions that bring about uh, uh, persecution, opposition, because of our stand for truth. Truth. Isn't it something? What, is it, what was it that, that uh, caused Jesus to be crucified? We've all considered that, haven't we? He was not, uh, he didn't attack anybody, did he? He wasn't waging warfare with uh, natural weapons and got killed on the battlefield no, he wasn't robbing or stealing and was executed for his crimes. He spoke truth. He spoke truth. It was because of his words. He had some things to say that so incensed people that they got the mob out and conspired and had him crucified because of his words, the things that he had to say. Well, it's important for us to be reminded of those things because, um, you know, we're, we, <clears throat> Christians, we were talking along these lines a couple of weeks ago, Christians sometimes want to be nice. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be nice. You sense a, a, a care for people, a love for people, and you think, wouldn't it be nice if they loved you too? And we could all just be happy and peaceful and, and one. But the message that Christians share is not always warmly received. But we can't change the message, can we? Just so that people won't get uh, uh, offended or flustered or... <clears throat> no. So over here in Isaiah chapter... 19, chapter 8, from verse 19. We'll read verses 19 and 20. And when they say to you, and I read from the New King James Version, and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak 
According to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What a declaration to the law and to the testimony. It is a call, it is a cry, it is a challenge coming from the prophet to the people of God that the word of God would be the reference. It would always be referred to as the standard by which we live, by which we judge, by which we determine and set course to the law and to the testimony. And if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. If they deviate from this word, then they are in darkness. If they embrace a philosophy, a perspective, a view that is inconsistent with what is written, it's because there is no light in them. And Christians understand that. Christians hold to the scripture as being inerrant and infallible. And they don't compromise. They, they you know, just uh, for the sake of a, a little harmony with this soul or, or that soul, we don't compromise. We are adamant. We are zealous. We're ready to earnestly contend for the faith, for the truth that's been delivered unto us. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, and that is the word of, of the, the Bible, that's the word that is being referred to, the scripture. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. The previous verse, verse 19, of course, he says, <clears throat> and, and when they say to you, and this is, you know, the, the, the Lord speaking through the prophet, and they, the people say to you, seek truth, in, this, in essence, seek wisdom, consult some other source, and the other source, you know, some medium, some wizard, some other uh, individual that would be in touch with the spirit realm, some other source of wisdom. And the Lord says, shouldn't the living seek the living? Should they be consulting the dead? To the law and to the testimony. So we, as God's people, direct people to the Lord, according to the scripture. It takes on a lot of different forms. We've talked here recently about preaching the word with conviction, with confidence, with boldness. Amen? But there's also a, a meekness and a gentleness, isn't there? Yeah? Look with me over to Matthew 11. <clears throat> May this evening's time together in the word serve <clears throat> as, a, uh, as a look at different ways in which the word is ministered, but always in purity. I always preach the word purely. This is a, 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 a verse. It speaks to us of the tenderness. I mean, you, you see the, the tenderness of, of Jesus as, a, as the shepherd of the sheep. He says in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, I'll acknowledge that, you know, coming from, right from Isaiah chapter 8, where the prophet is thundering to the law and to the testimony, uh, this is another way, at looking, another way of looking at the ministry of the word, isn't it? Because here, this isn't a cry for repentance. This isn't a Jeremiah uh, uh, speaking out against all the ills and the corruption, the idolatry that had plagued Israel now for generations. No, this is Jesus talking to lost and, and hurting souls. And he's saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And not un infrequently, not, <clears throat> uh, it's not uncommon, for us to run into people that are of, are of a broken heart. Amen? And we, we bid them to come to Jesus. But we always tell them to come the way of the cross. Amen? You've got to repent of your sins. There's no hope outside of Jesus. 
And we can, we can minister and should minister the truths of God's word with all appropriate uh, uh, tenderness and gentleness, but with directness, with directness, with plainness of speech. Amen? So we tell people, come to Jesus because there's no other way. And you come confessing your sins because you're a sinner. And if you'll humble yourself before the Lord, then the Lord is ready to reveal to you his, his son and make you, uh, cause you to know the love that he has for you. But there's salvation in no other. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Over in Isaiah 50. Look with me over to Isaiah 50. Verse 4. The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Now, as you look at this verse in context, it's pretty plainly a messianic prophecy. It's a description of the manner in which Jesus would minister, the skill with which he would minister, the, his knowledge of the word and his ability to, to speak a word in season. Just the right word, just the right way. But remember that uh, we have in us the spirit of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit wants to guide us in bringing a word in season. And sometimes it is a word of rebuke. It's a word of correction. Sometimes it's a word of exhortation, a word of instruction, perhaps. Sometimes it's a word of comfort. But it's always to be the word. A word in season that will benefit and that will profit a person, a brother or sister in the Lord, or a lost soul, regardless of their, of their situation, the word that they most need to hear is the word of God. Amen? Bring to the people that you're talking to the word of God. That's God's way. God's way is his word. The heart might be very heavy. Is there anything that could be of greater help than a word from the word? The eyes might be very blind and the heart might be very evidently hardened. Is there anything like the word of God that can break that hard heart? Open up those blind eyes? A word in season. That's what we want to be speaking, amen? A people who are led and directed by God's spirit and speak God's word. And while this passage, I, I, yeah, plainly is, a, is a, a reference to the Messiah, Jesus and his ability to teach and instruct and speak. We can look to the Lord that he would help us bring a word in season, the right word from his, his word. <clears throat> in Isaiah 61, just over a few chapters. Remember that, uh, you know, we read a passage such as this and, you know, <clears throat> Isaiah 50, or this one here in Isaiah 61. Ephesians tells us that we are to be imitators of God. Amen? We're to be imitators of God. And I think among the things that we could imitate would be the Lord's ability to speak a word in season. He didn't call everybody uh, uh, vipers and uh, whited sepulchers. But that's what they needed to hear, isn't it? Yeah, those people needed to hear that. But then to the, to the woman who had that spirit of infirmity, you know, he says, ought not this daughter of Abraham, of whom Satan is bound low these 18 years, be loosed from this infirmity? And you can just hear the compassion in his voice, can't you? 
as he rebukes the hypocrites and speaks a word that, that sets the captives free. A word in season. Well, here in Isaiah 61, not unlike the Isaiah 50 passage, he says, <clears throat> verse 1, and following, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Well, anointed to preach. Christians are anointed to, to preach. Christians are anointed with the Spirit of God to speak the Word of God. We, we've looked at it here recently. Again, a familiar passage there in Acts 1. You'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. To a very great degree, the power of the Holy Spirit working in the people of God uh, works, he works, to make us preachers or able ministers of the gospel so that we could speak the truth to people. Here, as Jesus, well, it's, it's recorded in the gospels, uh, Jesus quotes from this passage in Isaiah 61, and he speaks of how the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and anointed him to preach. Amen? And the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, he's alive inside of you, anointing you to preach the word. Of course, he, he goes on to preach good tidings, to proclaim liberty, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And we are to be imitators of God. Amen? He goes on, he says, the day of vengeance of our God. Uh, that's part of the message that we talk of as well, isn't it? Yeah. There's a day of judgment. There's a day of wrath that is coming. People, uh, some people you talk to think that things are bad in this world. This is like, uh, you know, Sunday picnic uh, compared to what it's going to be. It's getting real bad before our very eyes. Think of what it will be like during great tribulation. Think of what it will be like for those that are left behind. Well, you and I here this evening, knowing that the wrath of the Lamb is coming upon the inhabitants inhabitants of the earth very soon we warn people to flee from the wrath to come don't we yep we do the spirit of god is upon us to do so so yeah sometimes it's a warning sometimes it's proclaiming liberty to the captives you don't have to live in bondage to sin any longer but the the emphasis what we're saying is preach the word it's the word of god and uh, uh, as you learn, as the people of God learn the word of God, there's more there for the Holy Spirit to work with so that we could be skillful, like we've said. Amen? In the ministry of the word of God. You know what Hebrews 4.12 says, don't you? Yep. As soon as they start to quote it, you'll recognize it. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder, of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I think one of the reasons that I, <clears throat> I, uh, I refer to this passage as often as I do is because it just, it was one that the Holy Spirit impressed upon me in my early days as a Christian, uh, just ministering the gospel to people out on the streets preaching. And you'd go away and you'd think, wow, did they hear anything? You wonder, and you, you feel like you had a good opportunity to put a lot of truth on out there. But did it fall on deaf ears? Because they didn't, they didn't uh, the, the conversation didn't conclude with them uh, asking how they would be saved. But you know, you had so much truth right from the word of God that you spoke. And the Holy Spirit just reminds us, doesn't he? That that word is alive and powerful. And while we might not observe with our eyes uh, uh, 
uh, an immediate uh, transformation in the individual with a cry, a plea of brokenness. They're not breaking down, shedding tears, falling at our feet, saying, what must I do to be saved? You know that the word of God is alive. It's alive. That's when it says quick. That means it's living. It's living. The word of God is living. You know you don't just share a philosophy. You don't share the wisdom of man. You're not just talking religion. You're talking spiritual, eternal truth. When you say it is written, the Bible says, Jesus says, the gospel says. When you're quoting the word of God, speaking it, that's alive. Alive. The, the logos is alive and powerful. Preach the word. Amen? Amen? And yes, have a confidence. Because, <clears throat> you know, sometimes in the interest of, uh, of uh, making a convert, making a point, winning an argument, we might uh, try to get on over into worldly wisdom. We might find ourselves tempted to entertain the foolish and unlearned questions. This sharp two-edged sword will cut right through the foolish and unlearned questions. And if anything has the potential or the capacity to bring about a transformation, open up some blind eyes, bring life and light into a dark, dead heart, it's the word of God. Amen? It's a light that shines in darkness. The word of God, alive and powerful. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Talked with one recently. And uh, in several conversations with them, it's, um, it seems evident <clears throat> that... Uh, there is not in their, in their thinking uh, a clear distinction being made between things solical and things spiritual. Uh, God uses lots of different means to bring us to himself, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Yeah. There would be some here this evening that could testify of, uh, of coming to the Lord in, in some type of hardship. Uh, some... I, I know, and I don't think I embarrass anybody, but some, you know, were, were bound in, in, a, in a drug addiction or alcoholism. And uh, bottoming on out, you reckoned with how hopeless your condition was how incapable you were of licking, uh, kicking the addiction, living a decent life, a responsible life as, a, as, a, as a, just a, a human being. And in his mercy, the Lord brought you to a place of calling on his name for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul. Well, uh, you wouldn't, sit here this evening and say, you know, I'm thankful for alcohol. I'm thankful for all those drugs I took because they brought me to the end of myself. You wouldn't say that, would you? No, no, no. It's like the, uh, you know, the, the foxhole Christian. You know, he's, he's there in the foxhole and, and is, is a, uh, Buddy on one side gets blown to bits and buddy on that side gets blown to bits. And, uh, and he's afraid, man, I'm next. I could go to hell if I die. I would go to hell if I die. And he calls out to Jesus, God, forgive me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, you don't have to, you know, uh, uh, you don't, not all people need to come to Jesus that way, do they? Do they? No. We wouldn't say that, oh, war really has its benefits. We wouldn't say that, would we? No, no. But sometimes people get confused. 
They, they don't make a clear distinction between the workings of God and, and, uh, and just how God used uh, circumstances and sometimes calamities and people's sin. He uses people's sin to bring them to the end of themselves to see their own wretchedness. But that doesn't make sin good, does it? And that doesn't make the devil God's helper, does it? No, no. The word of God is a discerner between the thoughts and intents of the heart. It, can, it gets all that sorted on out for people who might not see and understand clearly what's going on, what's happening in this world. But the word of God will. You tell people the truth pertaining things spiritual. The word of God, what the Bible has to say, who Jesus is. Amen? The word of God is a discerner uh, <clears throat> of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It divides asunder between soul and spirit. <clears throat> we can move over to Acts 17. Acts 17. We're in the middle of one of Paul's <clears throat> missionary journeys. And he is at Berea, having come from Thessalonica, having come from Philippi. Good there? And it's verse 11 that I wanted to drop in on, where he says that these, the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. <clears throat> well, again, we bring this one along just because uh, there is such a value in us as the people of God digging into the word of God. Uh, you may be familiar with the commendation that he has for the Thessalonians. I mean, he, sa he says, uh, they received the word not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. That's what he writes to the Thessalonians. We'll probably get there in a couple of minutes. He says good things about the Thessalonians. But then to the, to the Bereans or of the Bereans, he says that they were more noble. So the Thessalonians were noble. These guys were even more noble. They dug into the word of God, which serious Christians do. That's why you sit here on an evening like this and you take some notes. You jot down the references. You, you make yourself some notes regarding some of the things we talked about in those references. You look up those scriptures. You read them in context. Because you want to become a, 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 an able minister of this gospel. Amen? A workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. You're, you're wanting to confirm. It's not like you're, you're sitting there, mm, I wonder if, uh, if Pastor Jim really rightly uh, uh, quoted this or, or rightly applied this. It's not like you're approaching the, your study and review of these from a, 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 a position of skepticism or doubt or even cynicism. No, no. You just value the, the exercise, the discipline of studying the verses in context, see them, seeing them uh, more fully, more clearly. There are times when Lord, I'm talking with people, bringing them some ministry from the word of God, and I sure hope that they jot down some notes and go away and study. Because I understand that, that, sure, there are times when I bring ministry and somebody doesn't get it right away. And they're not so sure that they see it that way. They may, you know, on, uh, they may have a history of, uh, of trust. You say, yeah, pastor, you know, he's never led us astray, but I'm not sure that I'm seeing it the way he's teaching it. Well... You dig in, you study it, have questions, come and ask them. Amen? You don't just, I, you're not going away just concluding, well, I don't, I don't like it, so I don't believe it. No. You look at the word of God. And maybe you don't like it. But you say, yeah, that's what the Bible has to say. And then, yeah, that's another passage that we talked of or 
some things that were shared with me in, in, that, in that discussion. And yeah, that's the Bible. That sure seems to be very applicable to the, the, the matter that we're discussing. And Paul says, that's a noble thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. You see, we want to not only know it, but we want these truths alive in our hearts. We want to give the Holy Spirit every opportunity to minister these truths to us so that we, they would be, so that we would be rooted and grounded and established and settled and that we would be able ministers, able to teach others also. Amen? That's God's, that's God's plan and purpose. Disciples are disciple makers, aren't they? Disciples are people who make disciples. And in order to do so, you got to know what the Bible has to say. So you study and you read and you minister and then you, you think, uh, yep, okay, and maybe you find yourself in the middle of some ministry and you think, hmm, what else does the Bible have to say on this subject? And you go away and you, you get even further strengthened in a particular truth so that on the revisit to the subject, you can bring even more light and life to bear on the matter. Amen? So Paul commends these Bereans for their noble searching of the scriptures. They received the word with all readiness of mind. See that? They received it with a readiness of mind. Not with a, a skepticism, right? Ah, I don't think. They didn't go away with an interest in uh, studying the scriptures so that they could get back with Paul and prove Paul wrong. That wasn't their attitude, was it? No, it says they received the word with all readiness of mind. They received it as, as being alive. And then they searched the scriptures. Yeah, look at that. Never saw that before. Never saw it that way. And the Lord desires to open up truth to people. So we're talking about preaching the, the word and also talking about studying it for ourselves that we could be more effective in our preaching. <clears throat> uh, you can, for your notes, jot down 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. It's here that he says, he talks of preaching the word, being instant in season, out of season, reproving, rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. The word of God is, is of a value for lots of different type of ministry, isn't it? And he's spoken of that, and we know that. Reproving, rebuking, exhorting, it's, it's, it's comforting. It can be very comforting. Come unto me, come to Jesus. Comforting words. The Lord Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll, he's the, the prince of peace. He gives joy. Yeah, but it's also the word of God is also for reproving and rebuking and exhorting, isn't it? And so Christians are prepared to bring that. And they understand that the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. I had a, uh, it was a, a troubling conversation with an individual there a couple weeks ago now. Uh, and it gave me occasion to go and, and look up the statement of faith of a local church, Odenton Baptist down the road there. Some folks from here have, have, uh, have uh, gone out of there, gone from here, there. <clears throat> People who are Pentecostal. And, and, <clears throat> and they, they go there now. And, uh, um, but this conversation that I had with this individual, and it, it related to this other church and their, um, their doctrine. And I was sharing this with, um, with some here the last few days. It gave me occasion to, to go to their website and read their statement of faith. Go there and follow this. <clears throat> uh, there are fully 17 uh, statements in their statement of faith on their website. And the very last one deals with spiritual gifts. I brought it along. Listen to it. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get that in my notes here. Here we go. The very, the, number 17 of the 17 that are listed says, we believe that God gave some apostles and some prophets 
and some evangelists, some, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, which is the local church. Now, that would be a, a pretty direct quote from Ephesians chapter 4, wouldn't it? Yeah, with regard to spiritual gifts. But then they go on in this same one. We also believe that upon the completion of the Bible in the first century A.D., all sign gifts, such as speaking in unknown tongues, supernatural healing, the working of miracles, and the spirit of discernment ceased for all time and are no longer given by the Spirit of God and are not to be practiced among men. Now, it was particularly noteworthy because <clears throat> I'm reading this online and on the screen, I see right above it, right above point number 17, uh, numerous scripture references. Good with me there? Uh, above 17. So those, those, the scripture references went with point 16. Good there? So I went, I scrolled all the way up to point number one and looked down point number one, numerous scripture references to support it, and point number two. And in some cases, points had sub points. And in each case, numerous scriptural references to support, their, to support the, the point that was being made, these, these different statements of faith. And wouldn't you know, you get down to point number 17 of their statement of faith that I just read to you, and guess how many supporting scriptures? Zero. Zero. How could somebody do that? How could you let that slide on your website, World Wide Web, you know? Well... You, you and I sit here this evening and say, yeah, that's because it'd be very difficult for them to come on up with biblical justification for that statement. It's not there, is it? No. I started to say, I had, a, I, I, I had an individual tell me not too long ago that it was arrogant of me. The, 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 the reference that I made to Tozer's statement that there is not a syllable in the New Testament to support the doctrine of cessation. Now, that's what Tozer said. I just, I just in agreement with, with, with Tozer. Because he's right. But the same individual is the one that, you know, referred me to this. How's that for inconsistent? It's, it's unfortunate that there are people professing Christianity that don't place any greater emphasis on the word of God being authoritative. That should not be that way, should it? No, it shouldn't. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and turn unto fables. And it's in this context that Paul says what? Preach the word. Preach the word. So you're going to talk to people and they'll stop their ears at your preaching. They'll say, they'll, no, I don't, I, hey, I, I, I'm a Christian and you can't tell me I'm not a Christian. Well, I didn't tell you you weren't a Christian. I just told you what the Bible had to say. I just told you that the, the scripture says this. And there will be those who turn away their ears from the truth. And when you turn away your ears from the truth, what do you turn to? It lies. Something that has been fabricated by the father of lies. Doctrines of demons, fables. Turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's a sad time. But that's what the man of God says will come. The Holy Spirit says those times will come. They will not endure sound doctrine. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. I just take us back over there. We were over here there a couple weeks ago.
2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 16. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now here, Paul's going to go on and he talk. You, you may be familiar with the, you know, the immediate context. He's talking about what he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's, he's an eyewitness. He personally was there. Jesus went up on that mount and he took with him Peter and James and John, didn't he? They saw Jesus transformed before their very eyes. They saw Moses and Elijah there speaking with Jesus. They heard the voice out of the, out of the clouds, didn't they? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. He says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. We heard it. Peter says, I heard it with my own ears. I saw with my eyes. And then he says, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So he is saying here that more sure than the word which he heard on the mountain with his ears, the things that he saw with his eyes, more sure than that are the words that are written in the Bible. We have a more sure word more sure than that word that I heard is this word, it is written. A more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is God's word. It is the word by which we live. It is the word which we preach. It's the word on which we stand. Our beliefs come from this book, these words. Amen? The wisdom that guides us in all our decisions, in the relationships that we have with one another, Difficult sometimes, yes, the difficult decisions, the hard but right decisions that we make are based upon the scripture, the more sure word of prophecy. Amen? So we minister to ourselves, we live by it, we preach it to others. We're not ashamed of it. We know that these are alive words. They are spirit words. The gospel, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. Amen? And so we, we preach it and we practice it and we dig in to get to know it better and we don't find fault with it and we don't pick and choose what parts we believe because this word is not the concoction of man, not cunningly devised fables. Divinely inspired. God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, moved upon men to write down exactly what he wanted them to write. God could do that, you know. He could use folks like you and me and move upon them. That's what he did. And you know, it's 66 books, 40-some authors over a period of 1,500-some years and one unified message that comes from the maker of heaven and earth, the ancient of days, the I am that I am. God speaks to humanity 
from the pages of this book, living words, words that are taught to us, as Christians taught to us, by the Spirit of God himself, written on the fleshy tables of our hearts. And then we're charged by God to take them and share them with others, to comfort with the comfort wherewith we've been comforted, to speak the truth in love, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, to speak that word in season. Amen? Because this is God's word. It's alive and powerful. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You could jot down for your notes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I brought it along. I don't think we'll take the time to go through it. And it, the chapter in its entirety, really, for the most part. It's just a... I brought it along, and I'll, I'll share with you briefly why I brought it along, because it's just an example of how... Uh, you'd see in the writings of Paul here that he continually makes reference to what he had to say. He spoke to them, he preached to them, he ministered the word to them, just over and over again. Those are the references. And that's what, that's what we do. We, we preach the gospel, don't we? Oh, we're to, we're to be kind and we're to, to care and be involved in one another's lives, but uh, always... Always sharing truth with one another.